Hello and welcome everyone to the San Francisco Public Library and to our monthly poem jam. Back live after a hiatus of a little over two years. So it's fabulous to see people uh, here again. I'm John Smalley, a librarian with the General Collections on the third floor. So I want to uh, acknowledge our community and then also just mention a couple events that are coming up uh, soon. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. And as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples, and we wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community. Uh, a couple things are coming up soon. At the end of this month, May 29th, which is a Sunday, 1 p.m., we are having a poetry reading by five uh, poets of uh, Nomadic Press. They're sending five of their poets here, so please come. It uh, should be a fabulous reading. Uh, June marks the 100th, uh, well, 2022 marks the 100th anniversary of the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses. So there'll be multiple exhibits starting in June on the third floor, the sixth floor. Uh, the book club on June 2nd is reading Ulysses. On June 5th, there'll be a film called Shalom, Ireland, uh, which looks at how uh, the history of the Jewish people in Ireland and how that uh, is reflected in Ulysses. There'll also be a talk by Ireland's ambassador on June 17th. That will be Zoom. He's Zooming in from Washington, DC, uh, presenting his book, which is an excellent guide to Ulysses, called Ulysses, A Reader's Odyssey. So that's just a taste of what's coming up. We're going to have a, uh, an action-packed summer, music, book readings, all sorts of stuff dealing with the climate, and you name it. So that's uh, just go to our website, sfpl.org, for more information. So uh, that ends my comments. I want to welcome to the stage Kim Shuck, our host and the Poem Jam presiding spirit. Please give a warm welcome to Kim Shuck. Oh, one last moment, we have disinfectant wipes at the podium, readers. The hand sanitizer and the disinfectant wipes are right there. This is the first one back and I'm freaking out just slightly. Um, I can't do it like that. Um, thank you for being here to celebrate Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, with this wonderful book um, that Bobby edited called Light on the Walls of Life. Um, it's a really great book. I've been looking through it for the last couple of days and I'm really pleased to be both part of it and be able to support it by having, by having us all read today. I'm going to just go ahead and cut to the chase and introduce Bobby Coleman. Um, what to say about Bobby? Um, relentless supporter of poetry and practitioner thereof. Um, one of the people who's been really important since to me since, since I became the laureate and uh, a friend, Bobby Coleman. Thank you, and thank you for coming. Thank you to the library, the friends, the contributors to this anthology, the supporters, to City Lights, which helped uh, promote the event and has been supportive throughout the project, and to Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Now, without Lawrence Ferlinghetti's example, what would the world look like? I just reviewed the October 13th, 1998 Poet Laureate inauguration and his inaugural address, which was here across the hall. And I was struck by a couple of things. First of all, there was his expansive presence and example, so humanistic and so beautiful in a way charismatic. And then there was the maturity of not only his life experience and perspective, but something innate about the human spirit. So when there was a heckler, of course, 
those of us in San Francisco who perform or recite know how to handle that kind of thing very well. In Lawrence's case, even after it recirculated after the mayor, during the mayor's introduction, Lawrence leaned on the edge of the podium and looked directly at the speaker and smiled, and smiled generously, prompting somebody, perhaps someone in this audience who was here, to say unprompted, that's a true public servant. I think that says a lot about what Lawrence offered us, but how Lawrence offered so much to the cultural life of the country. And he's known for so many different things that'll emerge in the, in the readings that you're about to hear. I'm very happy that the library is recording this for the legacy. We're pleased with the anthology, but this is a tribute to Lawrence first and foremost, and to what's in our hearts that connects with Lawrence's work and legacy. So I'll start with a very brief poem, one that Lawrence read on that occasion. And it, it resonates for me because it's the one I read at the spontaneous vigil on the night that we learned of his passing. He was nearly 102. And, you know, it was heartbreaking because we were, we had received Lawrence's blessing, his approval for this project. And it had, it was a week from going to the printer when he passed away. So that was a stunning turn of events because we were very eager for him to, to see it. It was something that he prompted for the benefit of youth poetry and arts education. He had published uh, poems in two of our prior anthologies from Jambu Press. So he trusted us and, you know, I think that we were all coming together to do something beautiful. And then he passed on, the project had to be reformatted, re reconceptualized, and it turned out that all the contributors to the book had somehow already been there, that the transcendence of the spirit of Ferlinghetti in connection with the contributors of art and poetry to the book had already anticipated the, the sort of big picture, the timeless element. So we added a memorial chapter, and I hope that the uh, love and spirit of, uh, of humanism and uh, of uh, spiritual breadth is there on every page of the book. So here's the poem, it's very short, At the Golden Gate. At the Golden Gate, a single plover, far at sea, wings across the horizon. A single rower, almost out of sight, rose his skull into eternity. And I take a Buddha crystal in my hand and begin becoming pure light. He spells skull, S-K-U-L-L. -L. Rose his skull into eternity, as opposed to, you know, the vessel, which would be S-C-U-L-L. -L. So there's a little pun on the page, which is typical Lawrence Berlinghetti. So um, I have the great pleasure of introducing the first of our readers, the former poet laureate as well, Devorah Major. Thank you. You know, when I uh, teach, uh, I teach at uh, California College of the Arts, and there's a lot of, of foreign students there, and I'm very critical of the United States for a lot of reasons. And I always say what I appreciate is um, free speech. And when I think, I mean, there's so many things to think of when you think of Lawrence Ferlinghetti, but what he did, putting his 
book, the bookstore on the line, publishing on the line, himself on the line, uh, for how um, is why I can be proud of America having free speech, really having it. So I really like that. So I was going to read, I, I, I had my poem A I was going to read, and then my poem B, if somebody else read it, I would read my poem A is not a good one to start with because it's Pity the Nation, and I don't want to start kind of with that. So my poem B uh, is Dove sta amore? Dove sta amore? Where lies love? Dove sta amore? Here lies love. The ring dove love in lyrical light. Here love's hill song. Love's true will song. Love's low plain song. In passages of night. Dove sta amore? Here lies love. The ring dove love. Dove sta amore? Here lies love. And I like that because it's, it's just sweet. And that's not usually the edge people see or speak to, I should say. And my poem is hiding. Here it is. Error in time. And it starts with this from Ferlinghetti. Well, the poem doesn't, but before the poem. Time, a traveler, melting in eternity, the mind coming and going. From back roads to far places, Ferlinghetti. Time exists only as a contract we keep or break, a memory we smell or forget, a terror we confront or duck, a bridge we build, blow up or build. Time does not move. It is the earth that shakes, the sky that rushes, we who surge. Time does not change. The world changes as we nourish or devour the life around us. Not in time, not on time, not despite time, but always in the moments named now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Devorah. And you know, I didn't hold up the book because I really wanted to be about Lawrence, but this is what the book looks like. And um, you may not be able to see it on camera, but it's an upward shot towards the sky uh, at the Via Ferlinghetti, which is the street in North Beach named after him. Lawrence was particularly tickled that it used to be an alley for bootleggers. Uh, George Long, are you prepared? Yes. So we have um, a musical interlude featuring saxophonist George Long, and then we'll continue with more Ferlinghetti and more poets. But George, will, George is going to take a moment to, um, to get up to where you can see him, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, the maestro will start to... Uh, will uh, start to blow the big saxophone. And you know, the reason, the reason that we have a mixture of the uh, arts and music is that that's the obvious milieu that, uh, that Ferlinghetti taps. And you'll hear later from, uh, from um, uh, Lawrence's uh, formal biographer, Neely Tchaikovsky, I'm, I'm sure that he and some of the other speakers will get into the mixture of arts and uh, culture that Lawrence represents. And here, George Long. Perhaps. No, be fine. You'll hear it. All right. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, George Long. Not just a great musician, but a great friend to the poets, and for many years, even before, before his friendship with me. So um, thank you, George. Yes. Gregory. Gregory so. Corso, with whom uh, George lived. George also um, made a contribution uh, of a recipe to the book that uh, Lawrence sent him. It didn't make the cut because it was too racy. <laughs> but I'll tell you about that in private. Uh, next is Neely Tchaikovsky, a great poet and also a biographer of Lawrence Ferlinghetti, both previously and reissued now. So, Neely, would you kindly come up and share with you not only some poetry from Lawrence, perhaps your poem in the book, and any tales of Lawrence that you wish to share at this tribute? The poem in the book is going to dinner. I'll find it while you... I've read that poem so many times. Okay. Uh, good evening. Yeah, th this book is such a labor of whatever. It's so beautiful. And Bobby, it, uh, it just reflects the genius of companionship and the nature of, of generosity that bespeak San Francisco and certainly Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I was very fortunate in the 1970s, along with a lot of other poets of my age, I was young then, to get to know Lawrence personally. He never acted like the great poet. He was just another guy in the neighborhood, albeit there were City Lights and City Lights Publishing and and uh, I became a good friend, and I found out very quickly, don't ask him about publishing or anything like that. But I, I, 40 years passed before I realized he had put a very substantial poem of mine in the City Lights Journal in 1975. And uh, 35 years later, he asked me, what did that poem mean? And I told him what it meant, and he said, if I'd known that, I never would have published it. Uh, Lawrence had a, aside from humility, a great sense of humor, as you, as a lot of you know. And uh, when I, so I got to know him, and one of the great things he did is he handed me the keys to his cabin at Bixby Canyon one day, and and. Uh, I was off to the races, and I went there with so many different people. I took my parents there, and uh, you had to cook on the stove outside, and you had to chop wood and draw water from the well and, and all that. That's what you did, and you're, you're the wasp, the bumblebee, the cicada, all these. And, and there was a woman living there who knew all the plants in the canyon. And Allen Ginsberg documented that in Bixby Canyon Ocean Path word breeze and there was a little outhouse and in the outhouse it had that was the buddhist anarchist temple according to lawrence in it it had jean jean jacques kerouac allen ginsburg gregory corso and i added my name at lawrence's behest and so i used that place for so many years and only a few years ago, Lawrence said, well, why don't you go down to Bixby again? Because I hadn't been in 30 years. And uh, at any rate, so, you know, we sort of drifted apart in the 80s for a while. I mean, we were there together, but we sort of, and, and, and lately came back together. I did this book in 78. So, what is that, more than 40 years ago. I did it as a poet, not as a scholar. You can find plenty of scholarly books. There have been two biographies since on Lawrence, and to my mind, they're books by scholars. So I'm a poet writing about a poet. I also did one about Charles Bukowski, who I was even closer to and, and, uh, than Lawrence. And then I did a book of essays called Whitman's Wild Children, about, which includes Lawrence, and uh, 
Bukowski and Allen Ginsberg and Harold Norse and all, uh, all kinds of Bobby Kaufman. And then some of you know, I also, I co-edited the collected poems of Bob Kaufman. But what I wanted to say was not only did I meet, so anyway, this book reissued, there'll be a review here in the Chronicle on Sunday. And uh, I've been telling people in North Beach, I got a review in the Chronicle. I don't get the Chronicle. None of them get the Chronicle. So uh, I get the Chronicle. I don't know why, but I get it. Anyway, um, it was amazing to me. They asked me to write it last year, and I said, I've done it already. And, but he convinced me to do it, and I'm glad I did because I learned a little more about my old friend, and we had already reestablished contact. There had been some problems about politics and things like that. But one thing with, with Lawrence is he transcended, like I believe I do, the, the, the narrow and sometimes narrow-minded ideology of the left. City Lights Journal in the 1960s had a photo of Ezra Pound on the cover and a story about him. And one of Lawrence's greatest poems is called Pound at Spoleto, the great Spoleto festival run by John Carlo Menotti. And Ezra Pound traveled with the fascists, but, but uh, Lawrence saw beyond that. He saw this great tragic figure who, who wrote this unbelievably magnificent lyrical poetry. I must say that my dear friend Diane de Prima knew that as well. She went to visit Pound at the Madhouse and uh, she said, I had to go. I mean, he was the man I would learn from. I needed to learn about poetry. So anyway, I, I called this act a little there, but uh, the other thing about being in North Beach in the 70s, so not only Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Allen Ginsberg, Diane de Prima, Philip Lamantia, the list goes on and on. I had already met and knew Jack Hirschman well from Los Angeles. He had come up two years earlier and then I came up. I joined him in San Francisco. And uh, the access that these people, these well-known established figures gave to us was absolutely phenomenal. Because Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso and Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Diane de Priva would, would be accessible to anybody. They, they didn't put up any walls. Sometimes people put on, oh my God, Allen Ginsberg, how can I? But there he was, and I never forgot that. And uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was quite amazing. So I was gonna read, uh, this is the book, there's the cover of Lawrence. For, you can see it, it's a, it's a really neat cover. And it, it's, it's from a photo by my father, and they had an artist, Mishigasset, go through it and do some things. And uh, I look at it now as a, as a, as a book of love. It's, and I, I think that, uh, that uh, one reviewer said, ah, once you get back past the Bohemian stuff, it was dismissing Bohemia, because the Bohemia is dismissed. And uh, tell me if I go too long, Bobby, I'm, I'm, I'm talking a little, I'll, I'll be done in a second. But, you know, Bohemia is dismissed. So, but, but, but of all things, the Wall Street Journal had a, a no, not the Wall Street. The Jesuit magazine <laughs> had this great review. And I loved it because the man talked about me as a poet before he talked about Lawrence. He understood that a poet was writing this book, and he understood my connection with Lawrence. So I won't read this. I'll just tell another anecdote or two. So a couple of years ago, four years ago, Aggie, something like that, I was in New Orleans for a festival, and it was great because they took me down first class and it was really nice. And uh, I was in this great hotel and, and I was incredibly depressed because I was in this big hotel and Aggie called me and she said, hello, Neely, this is Agneta. Lawrence wants to speak to you. So I called him up in San Francisco. I think he was 99 then. And he said, hello, Neely. And I said, hi, Lawrence, what's up? And he said, I just wanted to tell you that you have no idea of the influence you've had on so many people. 
And I immediately responded, I think you're talking about yourself. And then there was a moment of silence and I said, I love you, Lawrence. And he said, I love you too, Neely. And you know, I mean, that was like just great gold to me. That was amazing. And then, then they had the day of celebration on his 100th birthday. And if that wasn't a love fest, you know, I mean, I told Bobby a couple of days ago, I've laid enough laurel wreaths before Lawrence Ferlinghetti, you know, I mean, you know, what I have now is, is, is a much deeper sense of communion with him that's hard to say. It, it only goes one way because he's gone and I'm still here and I can speak. And um, I, I guess I'll end with a uh, poem that I wrote last night. And Lawrence is in here, but it's a, do some of you remember the tight, the poet is a tight, uh, 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 he's a, what do you call it? What is a guy who gets on a damned wire over the tie? Yeah, right. You know, he, it's a great poem about the poet is a tightrope or he walks, or, you know, and all that kind of thing. So I was at Specs last night and uh, I was looking across the street as a psychic shop. It's always, you know that thing? 24 hours a day, these red lights. And then there was a Transamerica pyramid and I opened up the Chronicle this morning and there's the pyramid. I have to see if I can read this. The light is so hard for me. The man on the high wire, beginning at the tip of the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco, is finding it difficult to negotiate troubled time. The psychic headquarters keeps a red light bright through the evening as smokers pollute the cul-de-sac in front of the bar. No wonder we turn our eyes to the performer way up on top of the sky. He is in trouble because he has knowledge we do not possess. In the storm brewing across the bay, dangerous ideas surface. Be careful. Watch yourself. How long will the planet flatter itself? Come around now. The center is collapsing yet again. Come now and cross to a new way of seeing. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, value each letter as if it were a wellspring. Come to the ancient cistern with your sister and brother, and you are seemingly, inevitably invincible, despite the dying trees and the slaughtered primates and the penetrating serpentine pile of rocks at roadside where you are speeding along on the road. No matter, the high wire man crosses his eyes. He jumps into the air. He is a bird. He's a plane, but soon he is working. He opens his eyes. Man is in trouble. His world chokes to death. The nude young men will not save it. Beautiful women can do nothing. Do you know old Henry Miller gave a Coney Island of the mind 
to the poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti on a sad November noon in the local cafe where many high wire acts got their start. Ferlinghetti says the performer behaves like an amusement entrepreneur for the common man. The poets are on wires, higher, ever higher. The man on the high wire of the Transamerica building treasures his fear. He envisions musk oxen in mythical north. His music box is stuffed with sorrow. Insignificant treasures are stored in his mind. He slips. We cannot save him from disaster. Down he comes and lands on cold concrete of Columbus Avenue sidewalk in the city of San Francisco Financial District. Say goodbye to the love of your life. If you panic, try only for a moment. Maybe the sea will wash over your thoughts on the day when the ark disappears. Thank you. That's it, okay. Glasses, glasses. Where are my glasses? Did they fall? Here. Ah, okay. Thank you, Neely. Yeah. I can barely survive this. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, Neely um, is very prolific, and it's really cool to hear something f fresh from the fresh from the notebook. And uh, you know, I have. Uh, I have uh, uh, the experience of a blue pencil, you know, as an editor, and Neely has two poems in the book that are different than that one. One was um, titled Ferlinghetti at 97, which um, was, you know, a tribute to Lawrence, and then he was kind enough to supply a second poem in memoriam for a memorial section that, you know, as the book was uh, revamped, uh, is in the, the, the portion at the end of the book, which uh, goes into that place. But also, you know, Neely, you mentioned the I love you to Lawrence, and I just said that to you two days ago. And um, I'm not sure I got the same, you know, uh, generosity of response that, uh, that Lawrence gave back. So, but you'll have your chance to say I love you. Um, and uh, the, um, the other thing I have to say is that the Transamerica building was a particular bete noir for Lawrence. He did not like that that replaced the Montgomery block, which was a, a, a place for artists. So um, uh, perhaps you were uh, referencing the fact that he really didn't like that pyramid. Anyway, next we have Aggie Falk, and I'm really excited because um, she represents uh, not only her own contributions to the book, but also, you know, uh, our belated Jack Hirschman, who was the fourth poet laureate of San Francisco. So thank you, Aggie. Aggie also has her art in the book, which is beautiful. Thank you. Do I? Yes, you do, the mask. Uh, oh, really? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, and there is, uh, uh, George wants to say something? He wants to talk to Bobby. Anyway, uh, actually, I want to second a lot of things that uh, Neely said about Lawrence, and that is of Lawrence's humility and how much he hated people talking about him being a famous person. He absolutely loathed that. Um, I spent many times with him around his kitchen table. We had a tradition, we would go once a month or so on a Sunday, and I would cook. And uh, we would invite a few people at the time, and we would sit around the table and talk. And speaking of Esra Pound, that would be Jack saying Esra Dog, <laughs> because Jack was not too fond of Pound because of him being a fascist. So that, I thought that was kind of funny. 
But I absolutely adored um, Lawrence for his... He, he was so sincere and he never... And, and the one thing that uh, nobody has mentioned yet is that he actually valued himself as an artist, a painter, more than as a poet. Not that he, he, he would always say that he preferred painting, he loved painting, and he was so sad at the end of his life that he could no longer really paint because he couldn't see. I spent many times with him, and we also happened to share a birthday two days apart, so we would um, celebrate with a princess cake and uh, whatever, dinner. And I also spent, Jack and I spent times with him in Italy. And again, you know, people were crazy about the beat generation. I go, what? He really thought they were insane. And uh, he wanted people to go away. We were sitting in a car once and they were banging on the windows and he said, tell them to go away. Because he just liked to be free free of attention so he could uh, free will and be himself and I totally understand that. So anyway, I'm not, I have so many lovely things to say about Lawrence, but I think um, Neely said a lot and I actually much want to read what I think is so timely and it's from his book, Time of Use Useful Consciousness. Um, I might say a few words later about him. Anyway, the one thing I actually do want to say is that he was never very demonstrative, except towards the end of his life, when he would actually, and I bring up, I love you again, he would just say that, I love you, to whoever he loved. He said it to me, he said it to many, I'm sure. This is number two in this book. It's long. I'm not probably going to read it all because maybe it's not time, but it's really timely. So that sailing westward from this crenellated old world of overage, I can see what you mean nearly, of overage Camembert Europe, millions washing up on virgin shores bright with promise. Awake and sing, you shall dwell in the dust. Ideas, alphabets, fornications, transmigrations, transgressions, Roman noses blown in Sephardic profiles, Arab lips praising Allah in Alabama, Alilalama, prayer rings traded for status, status symbols in Cincinnati, baseballs lost among payouts, quote, La Mattia, Boris and Bessie Tomachevsky, born Yiddish in the Ukraine, spawning the genus maestro MTT, you're not in the stettel. Shtetl anymore, baby. And birth certificates for the firstborn immigrant families inscribed with names like Americas D'Alessandro and not all pure heroes as various villains shown up to and various homegrown bourgeois fascists and defacers of the Statue of Liberty. Don't give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. And they shipped out Russian-born Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman back to where they came from. America, America, stranger than paradise to Hungarian immigrants named Jamush, who is the amazement made, who in his amazement made a film about it. And old hunchback Tony Tenori, Genovese fisherman smelling of garlic and pepperoni, catching crayfish in Bronx River of Parkway Road, Bronxville, where he lived in a hut by the railroad tracks, but sometimes could be heard the sweet, sad sound of the mandolin. 
en Gregorius Nuncio Corso på en calabrese often of Bleak Street um, and became a poet in prison, mouthing and mouthfuls of new American lingo and French Canuck uh, Jack Kerouac growing up in American Lower Massachusetts, Lower Massachusetts. I can hardly pronounce that, I see. A red, a red sock fan in his lumberjack shirt, s s I was going to say skirt, speaking for, oh God, the lighting. Speaking uh, uh, of Ma Mère, and Quebecian mother, and Delia Devine fled to America from the last great Irish potato famine, ending up a housekeeper in a fine mansion on Westchester, still speaking her rough Irish brogue and the sharp tongue she had, and fast on she spake, she spoke. She was with the wit of a publication's father drowning his fifth pint. Stop talking now. While millions of blacks uprooted out of Africa, deprived of homes and names, enslaved in the deep south, finally escaped to larger America to make a name for themselves. While W.E.B. Du Bois, born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, by a Dutch African mother and a father, descended from West African slaves, grew up to write the souls of black folk striking like thunderclap on the ears of those who didn't want to hear it. And Catholic Jack Powers in Boston, who never would go west, born black Irish in Rosebury projects, found the poor, fed the poor from them th throwaways at the public market and made poetry out of stone soup and beer all these years. The last babbling in cycles roam in mass general. Where now, brother, poet? I end that because it's very long. But it's actually, you should, you should if you haven't read it for a while, do read it. And I'm going to end with a very short poem I wrote for Lawrence called Blue Eyes because he had the bluest eyes you could ever find or see, rather. Blue Eyes. What blue eyes you have, the color of an infinite sea or a sky raised from all corners of the world the better to see the light strewn all over the streets, words lifted out of a brush with big heavy strokes, and many times around your kitchen table are spoons in bowls and bonami and poesy. And hearing your chuckles at the absurdity of it all as you enter the hall of fame with the humility and grace that still echo within all of us, whether it comes from your brush strokes or your pen. Rest in peace, Lawrence. It's very difficult, by the way, with the light there to see. Uh, yeah, hold, hold on, Neely. So um, I just want you to know that Agneta also represented our beloved Jack Hirschman. And so we'll, we'll circle back if there's time for more stories and additional material. I wanted to, Neely, please. I wanted, to, um, I wanted to highlight the beautiful videography that's happening because I did check the lighting and it looks gorgeous on the monitors. And I wanted to thank you because there's some confusion in the hall about whether or not it's turning out as it should. 
and I want to assure everybody that we're going to have a, and, and thank you to the viewers in the future who are going to be watching this and uh, hopefully being inspired by it. Thank you, library. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, team. Looks good. So um, I wanted to say that before I introduce Cesar Love, I wanted to say that there's a lot of connections, personal connections, that we all felt with somebody like Lawrence because Lawrence was expansive and available. And I don't go into this in the book. I don't go into, into it in the forward. I don't go into it in private conversations. But not only did I feel immediately connected to Lawrence when I met him decades ago as a young person, but as I researched the book to edit it properly, to bring the proper spirit to it, I found even deeper connections. And I, the reason that that, that happens is the same reason why the poet contributors and artist contributors to the book did such, a, did such a timeless job, I think, is because it was there in Lawrence to start with. And so the opportunity to connect with that is the way the heart works, the way the art works. So again, the book is a benefit to inculcate that feeling, that understanding through arts and poetry education. That was Lawrence's intention, that's our intention. I'm looking forward to many beautiful events with the library and elsewhere, and you'll all be invited. So with that, please, thank you so much, Cesar Love. Wow, I feel like I'm among giants and trying to just crawl on the shoulders of Lawrence and other people in this room, and I'm the first one here who doesn't really have a strong personal connection with Lawrence, but I have one anecdote to share, and that's when I first moved to town, moved to San Francisco in the late 80s, I had a roommate who was working f at City Hall with the Board of Supervisors, and this was when they were establishing the change of street names in North Beach and other parts of the city after San Francisco Riders. And there was a project to yeah, name streets after certain writers. And my, my roommate talked about meeting Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who was involved with this project, and he was just amazed at how gracious the man was. And yeah, I just kept that that sunk in. And I've just heard so many stories afterwards of just what a gracious person he was. And, you know, I'm yeah, I'm the first person to come up to the mic who doesn't have a personal connection, but like was said by Neely and others, you know, he influenced quite a lot of people, many of whom did not know him personally, and I'm one of them. So I'm very happy to be in this anthology. And Bobby, this is beautiful. I think this is the second time I've been in one of your anthologies. I was in the Occupy anthology. Oh my God. And I just remembering you know, anthologies are such great things. I didn't realize that until just recently. When you can be in a book with other people, that, with other writers, and y there's a community in this that's just established. You know, you read, uh, read their other works, you get to sort of share the same, the same binding and the same thing. The, you know, you're, you're there between these pages with all these other writers and you just feel this kinship with them. So thank you, Bobby. Thanks for bringing us all together. Um, so, Moving right along, I, I was looking through poems of his that I liked and which one am I going to read? And I came up with, or I found this one, and I rather like it. You probably are familiar with it. And I think, realize this is a theme because it's similar. I thought Neely was going to steal, steal his poems and read it ahead of me, but no, he didn't do so. so. So this is Constantly Risking Absurdity, number 15. Constantly risking absurdity and death wherever he performs above the heads of his audience. The poet, like an acrobat, climbs on rhyme to a high wire of his own making and balancing on eye beams above a sea of faces paces his way to the other side of day, performing ah through shahs and sleight of foot tricks and other high theatrics. And all without mistaking anything for what it may not be. For he's the super realist 
who must perforce perceive taught truth. Before the taking of each stance or step in his supposed advance toward that still higher perch where beauty stands and waits with gravity to start her death-defying leap. And he, a little Charlie Chaplin man who may or may not catch her fair eternal form, spread eagled in the empty air of existence. Okay, so um, moving on to lesser luminaries, myself. Um, thanks for publishing me, Bobby. This poem is called Playland of the Mind. Perhaps there are shores of heaven where deceased amusement parks go. Playland at the beach would be there. A few of its novelties are still with us. Laughing Sal at Fisherman's Wharf, Camera Obscura at the Cliff House. The Fun House is now black and white, a cameo in an Orson Welles movie, there at the end of The Lady from Shanghai. Playland is a memory to many, but condos and a safe way to more. My own memory is a camera without film. Was I ever there? I would have been very young. I have a blurry picture of a cloudy white day, a happy place near the ocean. In sharper focus, just beyond the frame, a merry-go-round in waltz, the roller coaster set to pounce, an ageless laughing sow. Was I ever at Playland? I could ask my mother, but it would ruin the spell. It would be like asking, was my father really friends with William Burroughs? Ocean winds shoulder their way across the great highway. A cascade of shrieks echoes from the roller coaster dive. I have never been to Cooney Island, but I have been to Playland at the beach, and my father was friends with William Burroughs. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Cesar. It was really a pleasure to edit you in all three anthologies. And the, the second of those three, Lawrence was in the prior two anthologies. The second of them, Feather Floating on the Water, Poems for Our Children, were from Mature, well, that's, you know, the jury's out on how mature, but adult uh, Bay Area poets uh, wrote poetry specifically for the students, the youth of the Bay Area. And uh, Jambu Press published this, um, you know, as a, as a public benefit. And we, Lawrence contributed um, two translations. His famous Prévert translate, translations went into the book. It was also illustrated. And at the back of the book were lesson plans for the students so that the teachers and the students could use the poems as prompts for learning to write poetry. And the poems stood up. I mean, when we did readings, we were before adult audiences and they, they liked it very much. So um, it was an unusual book that way. It went into all the libraries and all the school libraries, back when there were school libraries. So all the schools around the Bay Area got this book, and that was um, something that Cesar was in. Cesar also is involved in the in the, um, the the spoken word performance poetry open mic situation, and has been you know helpful as we've tried to carry that torch forward, which Lawrence was also involved with for decades. So, uh, for example, um, the Sacred Grounds series, which is the longest running open mic series. Um, uh, and Kim, of course, is, um, is uh, perpetuating these things. But Cesar remembers when the, when the uh, venue was closed for renovations and we had to sort of carry on in a back garden in the alley and Cesar was part of how we kept that longest running series going. So um, with that, you know, there's, uh, there's more music to come. 
but the next, uh, the next speaker is Anise Jacoby. And I wanted to say something as she makes her way up. Anise has history, uh, decades of history with Lawrence and the spirit of Lawrence. And y this is gonna blow your mind. She's in the book describing various projects. And um, you know, one thing about the book is that it's very visual. So Cesar hasn't, hasn't had a chance to curl up with the book yet, but your Playland references prompted me to put in lots of Playland stuff, uh, including vintage postcards and references to why the Bay Area um, is a sort of port of call for, for an unusual degree of creativity and freedom. So Playland lives. Anise Jacoby, thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby. Are we supposed to hold this, or is it? Oh, no. We don't need that. Hi. I brought a couple of show-and-tell visual aids, um, and I'll read part of the piece. But Bobby asked me to take on a topic that is so big that all I'm going to do is highlight it a drop through the lens of my own connection with Lawrence, which is which is, hi, can you hear me better now? Which is the relationship between art and politics. And as I think most of the people in this room know, that the profound way in which they are inseparable, both in terms of content and practice and outcome, is a lot of what we associate with the profundity of Lawrence's presence. And my very first, I'm gonna put this down so I'm not caring. My very first connection with Lawrence came after a very old, nasty battle that was when Jarvis Gans was passed, which at the time I was director of performing arts at Santa Cruz and doing hundreds of uh, ways in which you brought culture to the public in a very free form, happy way. We did a 24 hour June 16th of um, Norman O. Brown rising out of a coffin on the hillside for Ulysses and um, the Finnegan's Wake and all of those other things. The, we had a f marvelous creativity. The day that that was passed, I was basically told that my budget and using students in such a creative way would be reduced by 90%. And I was young enough to be arrogant that I literally quit on the spot because I was tired of the arts being in a beggar position. So I, in, in a brief conversation with Lawrence, he gave me permission because he was able to harness through this creativity that poetry has its cookies to give out. So we reinvented fortune cookies with poetry inside. These are intuitional devices, not sacred, but to use poetry instead of some of the more mundane things we've all been given in our fortune cookies elevated and then we put on poetry readings in department stores all over the country, literally. Manhattan, we had people like Gwendolyn Brooks in Chicago, all over. And the idea of bringing poetry into public life and Lawrence was one of the people who gave this a blessing using his quote from Coney Island of the Mines as part of the incentive. So the, ne the next time was when in 1992, we all remember that the last time poetry was in public was when we had the inauguration of, um, we all know his name, the poet who read at John Kennedy's inauguration. Robert but Frost. Robert Frost, excuse me, I should know that because I had a lover's quarrel with the world. Is it on his grave? And he, there was no other poet laureate until 1992 when um, 
Maya Angelou read at Bill Clinton's. It happens not to be my most favorite poem, but what it did was bring poetry back into public life. And with Lawrence and many other people, including friends of the library, we created City of Poets. Neely was a part of this on the principle that there are more poets in San Francisco when we have the permission to wear the Bardic Beret, and it was a celebration of the place of poetry in public life. The first poet laureateship of, of San Francisco came out of that, as well as many other things, including uh, an event that I will tell you about in this story that was published that connects to Lawrence bringing Allen Ginsberg to Candlestick Park to open a game for the Giants, which put poetry on national radio for two weeks when he was interviewed about it. And uh, I'll tell you more about that in a second. But the notion of poetry as it connects to politics, an example being when Joseph Brodsky as a young man was brought up to court in Russia because he wasn't officially in the writer's union, he was sent off and punished, and the judge says to whom who made you a poet, he said, I made myself a poet. And that was the spirit in which Lawrence recognized both the anointment and the invocation and the consequence of having the audacity to frame words and know their power. And of course with Lawrence, the good thing was that he added humor and humility and compassion and many other ingredients that are kind of essential to why we, we revere him, basically. As Bobby said to me on the phone when he called, he said, Lawrence is immortal, the rest of us are mortals. I think that's what's happening now. And the next time I really thought about it, obviously we know he already was a pioneer, his 1957 response to the police, and it was the juvenile section of the police that caused the obscenity charge against Howell. He was not just standing up as a businessman. He was not just standing up as someone who was defending the rights of creativity. He was standing up for the free speech, and that moment in time was, and is given credit fairly universally, as the turning point for the social and cultural revolution that followed to this day and is still going on. And actually, we have to kind of fortify our, our trenches right now. So the next time... Well, I'm going to skip one next time because this is an incomplete... Uh, chronological, I'm going to go back to Allen Ginsberg's memorial that I worked on with Lawrence in a moment. But Lawrence, as all of us, are equally concerned with the tragedy of the unhoused who live in this very rich situation in a city that should be ashamed of this ongoing tragedy. We created as City of Poets, something called Undercover. And it was to create a protection. So this is my second little show and tell. All right. I probably should just put it on so you'll see it. Whoops. OK. If you can see. And Lawrence's, Lawrence's words, poetry is the shortest distance between two people. Not only was it printed on these hundreds of blankets made by citizens with the idea that we have to protect and cover, they were distributed with books of poetry and all kinds of little convenient practical thing in the pockets to hundreds of people so that they would become visible, comforted, and protected. It was a major event. It was not meant to fix the homeless problem, but to bring media attention to it. 
It was very successful as a media project. I don't think we fixed the problem at all. So then back to another major event that cross paths with Lawrence, and it's when Allen Ginsberg died. I'm gonna just read you the piece that was published in LitHub. It's short, not too long. In the spring of 1997, Nancy Peters, the remarkable publisher at City Lights Book, called me with the sad news that Allen Ginsberg had died. It was really hard to imagine the world without him. Alan and I were allied as poet and pacifists over decades of reasons to rally. The world knew Alan as a rapturous poet who rigorously opposed militarism, materialism, and sexual repression. My freshman year, a college senior, the emerging poet Ann Waldman, took me to a New Year's party downtown Manhattan at midnight. Alan led an ecstatic circle of rolling ohms. This was before his notorious chant at the Chicago 7 trial. Alan's loss felt personal, as it did for generations of poets. Days after Alan's death, I met with Anne Lawrence and Nancy at City Lights. They asked me to put together a performance honoring Alan for a memorial. I invited hundreds of poets to partake in a chorale the following Sunday at Temple Emmanuel. We spread the word to gather at the temple, a landmark congregation founded in the gold rush. When the San Francisco Chronicle showcased the rosters of luminaries joining the poet's cottage, Michael Savage, right-wing radio attack dog, seized the chance to condemn the event. Savage treated Allen Ginsberg's, Ginsberg's memorial as a target for suicide bombers, claiming no temple should soil itself with a pinko faggot. Radio ballistics were usually material for Savage's daily devouring in the days when he was still a local shock jock. Like many under attack, I went into a zone of surprise and shameful fear. I felt responsible to both City Lights and Temple Emanuel for the fact that my passionate offering had drawn such cynical and dangerous attention. My night was completely sleepless remembering the last time I spent any real time with Alan. After a long rainy day meeting up at a bar in North Beach, probably Tosca's, we argued about what he should read at the ballpark before a Giants game the next day. He had been invited to join City of Poets, San Francisco Library's campaign for the staging of poetry in public life. Alan was fierce in dismissing my suggestions for a poem with universal appeal. Oh, I've read at stadiums to 40,000 people in Prague. No one wants to tame me. I don't want to be polite on national television. I ain't going to be no Maya Angelou for you, darling. That night in North Beach trying to pick a poem for the ball game with a force field, I was on alert, always in a hot zone with Alan, ruffling the reactionaries. The next day, Alan knocked the ball out of the park, reading his poem, Fuck Bomb, to booze and cheers. My children were beaming in the skybox at Candlestick Park with San Francisco Mayor Frank Jordan and a fleet of media on the jumbotron in epic scale. Ginsburg bellowed, resembling an Old Testament depiction of God. Allen was such a big hit that he was interviewed on national sports radio for weeks following the game. He was treated like a hero, inspiring citizens how to be powerful without being violent. He was correct. Provocateurs get more results than pacifiers. The, poet, the poets led the mourners into the chapel. Everyone was chanting under a celestial star, dome of stars. Now, three years later, Alan had died and Michael Savage took the Chronicle article as 
bait to go on attack. The memorial was Savage's red meat. He harped and carped an insidious familiar fears that gained traction, even in progressive Bay Area. Racists and homophobes reside all over. Even after the fall of the Soviet Union, the peace dividend was not a baited commie baiting was in full blast. I complained to Lawrence, isn't it crazy how a shock jock is living up to his name? Yes, his real name is Savage, like Donald Trump destroying Atlantic City, had jokes about Trump cards playing to empty casinos, all cashed out. Savage is a beast, takes pleasure in attack. Without hesitation, Lawrence put things in perspective. This savage attack would not have ruffled or reduced Allen at all. Man up to the haters, bow down, and you give them license. I'm more worried about the temple as a target of anti-Semitism. We are going to organize a mass public poetry kaddish. The next morning, Nancy Lawrence and I had an emergency meeting at the Temple Emanuel with the chief rabbi. In the past 24 hours, there had been a barrage of bomb threats, congregant complaints. Verling Getty insisted, lamenting the loss of his beloved friend. Allen Ginsberg must be honored in the city that he first read Howell. Allen's words still throb. Trust what you see, yes. The insanity in the supermarket aisles, yes. The air waves full of madmen. The rabbi was also adamant. The memorial must go on. Capitulating to nasty intimidation would be contrary to everything that Allen believed in, lived for, and manifested. We were emboldened to proceed, and I was relieved but still nervous security would be beefed up. On Sunday, thousands of mourners gathered with many more thousands turned for, away for lack of space. Poets performed a grand oratorio drawn from Allen Ginsberg's elegiac Kaddish, a poem he wrote after his mother's death, riffing on the traditional Jewish mourner's prayer. The temple courtyard was lavishly scented with thousands of oranges floating in the Moorish fountain. The poets, all dressed in white, the color of mourning, of purity and hope, sang a lament of Ginsburg's words, incantory repetitions, dancing through the crowd. They formed a processional of people praying and crying through the arched columns. The poets led the mourners into the chapel, everyone chanting under the celestial turquoise dome of stars. Thank you, Anise Jacoby. Um, you know, I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't mention that Jambu Press has been around a dozen years and was uh, founded by Virginia Barrett. It's a J-A-M-B-U is a small press collective. Um, and Virginia and Satya Pate are on the East uh, Coast, and Virginia can't be here because she's doing some heroic elder care for her father. It, her bo this book was her concept, and she went through about three dozen mock-ups of this cover, including some that were based on um, the art of some of the contributors, and some of which were, uh, were based on um, historic covers from Lawrence's books, such as Love in the Days of Rage. We actually almost went with that one. So we have a couple more readers and, and uh, a, a minimum of time. Um, I uh, want to call up Kellyanne uh, because she's come from Vallejo. And uh, she lived around the corner from, from the late QR hand. And she has been absolutely delightful to work with. So Kellyanne, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I'll be brief. Um, I also did not know um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti personally, but uh, crossed 
paths many times. And I would say that for anybody who is in the poetry community, that uh, we're sort of like a spirograph of concentric circles that are all spinning around each other. And, um, and uh, moving here from Los Angeles, coming to City Lights for the first time, um, I was an aspiring poet and I found my first place that I felt like I belonged. And from that point, um, I met the people that have become my poetry family. Um, with one of them being right here. Uh, so I'm gonna read a, a poem uh, called uh, In Goya's Great Esteems We Seem to See, and I'll tell you why um, after I read it. By Lawrence Ferlinghetti. In Goya's Great Esteems We Seem to See the People of the World exactly at the moment when they first attain the title of suffering humanity. They writhe upon the page in a veritable rage of adversity, heaped up, groaning with babies and bayonets under cement skies. In an abstract landscape of blasted trees, bent statues, bat wings, and beaks, Slippery giblets, cadavers, carnivorous cocks, and all the final hollering monsters of the imagination of disaster. They're so bloody real. It's as if they still really, or they really still existed, and they do. Only the landscape is changed. They are still ranged along the roads, plagued by legionnaires, false windmills, and demented roosters. They aren't the same people, only further from home. On freeways, 50 lanes wide, on a concrete continent, space with bland billboards, illustrating imbecile illusions of happiness. The scene shows fewer uh, tumbrils, but more strung out citizens, in painted cars, and they have strange license plates and engines that devour America. Um, I have two poems, <laughs> thank you. I have two poems in the book, and the first is an ode to city lights, and it's of me uh, landing and falling in love and falling home, but I'm not reading that poem. I'm reading the second poem, which is an ecrastic piece of uh, the Boat People, uh, 2006. So there's a couple of versions of Boat People. This one spoke to me, and um, and I couldn't tell you why in the beginning. It just kept, I kept coming back to it. I kept coming back to it. And it wasn't until I looked later that I saw the figures in the water, um, and I understood what was calling to me. What I first saw in this painting, and I'll leave it up front when people go to grab books, uh, there's of course a, a figure uh, who cannot see, a figure who cannot speak, and there are two figures at the front of the boat, and one, it reminded me of maybe a mother and a child. Um, and so the reason I read the first piece was the first ekphrastic poem that I wrote was a piece uh, by Goya. And so um, this is my piece, or this is my acrostic poem. Um, and of course, this is much nicer than Goya, but uh, it's called Boat People. I remember running on the beach in another life, but I've since forgotten the firmness of land, the tenuous of sand, the firmness of soil, slipping, shifting sand, transitions us to thin boards beneath us in fluid buoyancy. I'm a buoy, I'm a boy. I am a bobbing boat to an unknown destination, bobbing and rocking, holding fierce to the view of shore to return to land. No. 
not my land, but a place to land in another land, the first unsafe and the other safer. A land I do not know, but the stars do, the only thing I carry from home. Passing under invisible meridians, under familiar skies, waiting for a sign, you are here, waiting to return to land, a place to land, now my land. Thank you. Thank you, Kellyanne. As Dominic Anjarame comes up to the mic, I wanted to also acknowledge Kim Shuck and uh, uh, our friendship, and uh, it's so uh, beautiful, really, and thank you for doing this. And also, um, the book includes uh, uh, other poet laureates living and unfortunately departed, as well as uh, a, car um, a living US poet laureate, and lots of contributors who would be here and there will be more events and they'll be, you know, findable online in the future. So we're looking forward to everyone participating. Right now, Dominic Anjarami, thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me explain that Dominic Anjarami is not only a fixture in this city for a long time, but is also an, an award-winning, world-class experimental filmmaker as well as my friend. So he brings a whole nother dimension to what we're doing here today. Thanks, Dominic. Thank you, Bobby. Um, you know, I'd like to um, congratulate Bobby and Virginia Barrett on this book. You know, I've lived in North Beach since 1979. And, um, you know, I've seen, you know, tons of poetry books come out. And this is one of the more exciting books I've seen in, in recent years. It combines poetry, combines photographs, it combines illustrations and paintings, and, and, some, and great poetry. You know, it was a joy for me to sit through and read this book. And I normally don't go and sit through and, and read an entire poetry book, but this book I have. So a round of applause uh, for Bobby. Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Photograph which appears on the back. Yeah, I'm not in. I'm not in the book, but I'm on the book. This is my photograph uh, from the 50th anniversary of uh, City Lights. Uh, I got Lawrence in a very reflective uh, moment there. Uh, this book opens up. All I ever wanted to do was paint light on the walls of life, more light. And this is what I do. I'm an avant-garde filmmaker. I paint black and white images on a screen, moving light. Uh, my favorite poet, Jean Cocteau, uh, once said that all artists are poets. And, um, you know, and I have a tendency to agree with him. It just depends on what your uh, definition of poetry is. Um, you know, I've made more than 35 16 millimeter films, lived in North Beach since 1979. And, you know, I was not an intimate friend of uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Um, I ran Canyon Cinema. I've been involved basically in the avant-garde film scene. And one of my specialties is studying uh, the Bay Area during the 40s and 50s, which was the center of experimental and avant-garde film. And I've been going to Cuba since, 19, since 2000 and six, uh, showing avant-garde films and bringing down books of Lawrence Ferlinghetti to donate to the library that they love his work. And, um, you know, I, I, I knew Lawrence from the neighborhood. We'd walk around, say hi, you know, I'd go up uh, and get some autographs once in a while. But, you know, we weren't intimate friends. And one day he's sitting at the Cafe Trieste and he's sitting alone and I sit down and I tell him that I'm going to Cuba and I'm showing avant-garde films and he, you know, he, he tells me this great story about meeting Fidel and what it meant to him to go to Cuba. And uh, not only did he support me vocally, he also uh, donated financially to, to my trips to Cuba, which were uh, the, the film festival down there could not support. Um, I've taught almost in every uh, university in the Bay Area from the New College, San Francisco Art Institute, UC Berkeley, uh, University of Nevada, Reno, and um, the International Film and Radio School in, uh, in Cuba. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, 
San Francisco being the center, many of the poets of the 40s and 50s came to filmmaking. Uh, they included people such as uh, Harry Smith, who was making films in Berkeley, uh, Jordan Belson, who worked out of North Beach, Hi Hirsch, uh, Christopher McLean, James Broughton, some of these people you probably heard of, Stan Brackage worked here for a while, and Kenneth Anger uh, premiered Scorpio Rising in a, por in a theater that's on Kearney Street that used to be a porno theater uh, and magazine shop, basically selling scatological kind of stuff. And now it's the uh, center for uh, North Beach citizens. And, um, Lawrence was friends of many of these filmmakers, and in 1958, he participated, he did the narration for a film made by uh, Phil Green uh, from the California School of Arts, otherwise known as the San Francisco Art Institute. It's called Have You Sold Your Dozen Roses? And I looked last night, Hell in High Water, I could not find a copy of that poem. I'm not sure it's in print. But Lawrence is reading a narration over images of the city dump, which at that time was in um, the naval shipyard, and people scavenging uh, through the junk trying to find stuff. And it's an incredibly brilliant uh, poem. It is on YouTube. You know, this is Tech Week, which is kind of a joke. I know Lawrence Ferlinghetti was a real supporter of, of technology, uh, reading books on Kindle. I know, I know he was very enthusiastic <laughs> about that. Uh, we talked many times about, uh, you know, about how important technology is. You know, and for poetry, what do you need? A pen and a piece of paper. You know, that's, that's high tech. You know, and, and in this day and age, you can't get a book from France without spending $25 for postage. Or if it's not online, you don't get to read it. You know, uh, you know and we're being taped. And, you know, this is film. You know, I don't know what that stuff is back there, but this is celluloid film uh, where it all began. So, you know, with high tech, you know, we're ignoring the analog world where, you know, the typewriter was the first to go. Anyone here own a typewriter? One, two, three, four, because the poets own typewriters. And you can erase and you can see the indentation of the type. Everything's not perfect. So, um, so you know, I make short films. You can see my work on Vimeo. You just have to know how to spell my name right. So I'm glad to be part of this book and congratulations, Bobby. Very, very kind of you, Dominic. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to be sort of riding out with George Long on saxophone, and we're, we're kind of over time, so maybe we'll add the soundtrack and filter out as he plays. And the, um, the book is available at Jambu Press, J-A-M-B-U, press.com, and through small press distribution, booksellers, like analog booksellers, uh, and uh, of course, libraries can order it, and um, thank you, Kim Shuck, and everyone else. Thank you. Jo uh, I, I, I don't think it's been digitalized, but perhaps by the time somebody's watching this, who knows? <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to the AV people for sticking around. Thank you to John for making all of this possible. Thank you library, thank you poets. Take care.